This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Michigan Studios of WKTV. Let's go inside for Silent Voices. Hello and welcome to another edition of Silent Voices. I'm your host Dennis Lawrence and today we have another grandparent story. Uh, we have a Beth Berryhill with us from Rockford, Michigan and she's come to tell us her grandparent story. Uh, before we get started, Beth, I want to flip some pictures of your uh, grandchildren, Derek and Jason, on the screen here. Uh, I've had several grandparents come to me in the last year uh, emailing and calling. They've been looking out for the best interest of their grandchildren, yet the court system refuses to allow grandchildren to come and live with their parents many times, or grandparents many times, and uh, it's an uphill battle and struggle. So um, I want to, with that being said, you know, I, I, I'm a grandparent, and I had grandparent my grandchildren for 10 months, and they were removed out of my custody, uh, no abuse or neglect involved, and in fact, they've been adopted out since. And so I felt the pain. I know what it's like to go through something like that. And um, with that being said, I, I like to get to your story. Now, your story actually starts way back in 1984 before your grandkids are even born. You want to give us a little history on that? Um, I had two children, and I was on probation. Uh, I gave birth to my second child, violated my probation while the, um, while I was in the jail within one hour, the people that I had trusted my youngest, the newborn with, um, they turned around and they turned the children over to CPS saying that they didn't know where I was, that I had abandoned them. Um, CPS called me and they told me that they had him, that they couldn't locate my oldest son but that as soon as I got out of jail, I would get both my children returned right back to me as long as I went to their office. I went to their office and instead was told that if I just said that I was a drug addict, that as long as I could stay clean and test you know, clean, within six months I would have my kids back. It didn't work out that way. And January 1st, Nine, or January 2nd of 1987, they terminated my rights, stating that if, the, if my two boys were um, returned back home, the three-month-old son that I had would um, turn out to be a neglected child. Okay, now you had made arrangements with these people that actually turned you in, uh, gave them $150 to watch your child for 25 days while you were in jail. Your other child was with your parents, I believe? Uh, his father's parents. Okay, his father's parents. Now, was he also taken by CPS? Uh, he ended up going into foster care for a period of maybe 30 to 60 days, but his behavior got so bad that they ended up having to return him back to the grandparents. And how old was this child? Two. Two years old, yes. traumatic, traumatic experience being taken away from his uh, uh, grandparents. grandparents. Yes. So, and you were at this time put on the registry, weren't you? Yes, I was. The abuse and neglect registry. Uh, this registry, you can be put on by a CPS worker. You don't have to go through court, were you put on prior to your uh, court When I was hearing? 16 years old, 
I was an unwed mother. At the time, it was 1980, girls did not raise their children. I put my child that I gave birth to up for adoption, looking out for his best interest, and I was placed on the registry for termination of parental rights. So by giving up your child when you were 16, you were actually put on the abuse and neglect registry. Yes. And um, this registry nowadays, you can't even uh, attend uh, school events to uh, you know, go on uh, field trips with your grandkids or your children. You can't work at a school. You, I understand that that's following over to the uh, medical profession pediatrics right so uh, it's a very uh, serious ordeal just for um, giving up your baby doing the, what was in the best interest of that child right so let's forward up to October 2010 and this would have been with your grandchildren right tell us tell us about your relationship you had custody of one uh, boy, which was Jason, and your daughter had custody of the other child, Derek. Derek. Yep. So how did that come about? How did you get custody of that? Jason, uh, Jason? was born August 22nd, 2007. Mom, during her pregnancy, was not uh, bonded with the pregnancy. I don't, I don't know how to really uh, reiterate what that was, but... She didn't feel that she could protect her child because the father was a mental case. He wanted her to abort. She was going to abort. I talked her out of aborting. Told her, by the time you give birth to this baby, you're going to be in love with it. She gave birth. She said, Mom, I'm going to put him up for adoption. And I told her, because of my past history, Tiana, it would be the worst thing in the world you could ever do because you can't take it back. So. She asked me at the hospital if I would take Jason and raise Jason because then she could watch him grow up, and, but she knew that he was going to be cared for. And when Jason was three months old, she left for Florida. And before doing so, she uh, filled out paperwork with probate court to give me full legal guardianship. So you had full guardianship of this uh, boy, Jason. Yes. And I understand, and we'll get to that later, but I understand that was wiped out by a CPS worker later on yes. in this case. Now you, uh, when was Derek, Jason was born what year? 2007. And Derek was born? May 2009. Okay, and your daughter had kept Derek, am yes. I correct, and was yes. raising him. Okay, so how did CPS get involved in your lives again? Um, uh, my daughter moved to the south end into Cutlerville, and she, um, her landlord was a real basket case. He was constantly harassing her, calling CPS on her. Every time CPS got called on her, they would send a CPS worker up to investigate Jason. And at one point, I did speak to a CPS worker and said, look, I am Jason's parent. Even though I was his grandparent, I was his parent. You, you were actually was his legal guardian, which yep. Jason shouldn't have even been involved in this. Right. And I told her, I'm getting tired of people interrupting Jason's life because somebody has a problem with the mother. And the lady, the lady decided that you know, there wasn't even any reason for her to be there, and we sat there, drank coffee, and talked about the view from my patio door, which was the lake. So, uh, that was your first uh, visit with Derek, or with the CPS worker? With CPS worth, worker, yes. Involving your uh, guardianship of Jason. Right. Because of your daughter being involved with CPS. What happened from there, then? Um... Well, in, in April, March or April of 2010, I was diagnosed with cancer. And um, in September, I'd had a second surgery, which was nine days prior to CPS coming to talk to, to me about 
Jason getting out of the house. And um, I met with the CPS worker because I had nothing to hide. I had childproof locks on my doors that should not have been impenetrable with a child. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and we agreed that, you know, I would go get another kind of lock for my slider that was not reachable by Jason. And he left the house. He was like, this is nothing. We won't put you on central registry. You're good, you know. And he left. So, so you're, you was being a little boy, and he, he got out of the pen, yes. so to speak. And the, the, reason, the reason between the safety locks wasn't even the fact that I live on a lake and I was worried about him drowning, because at three months old, I started him out swimming. And we taught him boundaries. He knew where he could go, what had to be done in order for him to get there. You know, I mean, and he was under constant supervision. He was not allowed even to walk out that door unless he had our hands. You know, uh, his life vest always hung near the door, so he could put his life vest on and go out into the backyard. And, and this is something we trained him with, you know, taught him. Now, now was, was both Jason and Derek, were they both removed at the same time, or? Yes. Okay, I was, what was the reasoning behind that? When, when were they removed? On October 1st of 2010, the same day the CPS worker came, my daughter had asked me prior to him even being there, would I babysit Derek? Because she wanted to go to the haunt. And I said, well, you know, I really don't feel up to it, but okay, I will. I said, so I need you and my sister-in-law, Lizzie, to drop Derek off on their way to Muskegon. And that was where it was supposed to have stood. But instead, my daughter sent her, her boyfriend up to deliver Derek to my house. And the CPS worker, she told the, C, you know, she told the CPS worker that Derek was at my house. He called me on my cell phone as I was coming back from picking up my car because I still was not able to drive. I was still under doctor's orders. No lifting of 10 pounds or more. Uh, no driving or anything like that from my second surgery. So my son had to drive me. Um, my older son, Rusty, who was involved in the 84 case, he was at my house. He had come up to visit for the day. And so I left him with Jason and Derek and drove not even five minutes down the road and back. As I got um, a block from my house, CPS worker called me and said, where is Derek? I said, he's at my house. And he said, how did he get there? I said, well, Tiana sent him up with David driving. You know, and he started yelling and screaming at me and hung up the phone. And I called him back and I told him, I said, David is not with the boys. My, uh, my son is with the boys. But the only reason that David was still at my house was because he was waiting for me to give him five bucks so he could have gas to get back into Grand uh -huh. Rapids. So David, the boyfriend, was he supposed to be around these no. kids? Or? No. And uh, even if they had worked things out and got married, I still would probably have been doing a two, three day drive back and forth to their house to check on the welfare of Derek. So what did David do anyway? The David, um, in March of, February, March of 2010, spanked Derek, who was nine months old, and left a handprint on him, on his butt. So you left a handprint yes, on his butt. Yes, and I've, I've seen the handprint, and so I that know was, that it happened. That was from a prior CPS investigation that they right. had that information. Right. So he dropped Derek off, and uh, he, he wasn't supposed to be, a, be around the child. Um, he wasn't supposed to be around the child as far as CPS was concerned. But, but wasn't. I had talked to the probation officer, and the probation officer knew where he was living and knew that he was still there with the child and um, had come up with a plan that David had to do parenting classes and anger management and stuff like that in order to continue being around the there child. Was there was no court order then no. in place. It just was no contact. It was just what, during CPS, his sentencing. Yeah. Okay, so what did the CPS worker after he hung up? Did he come back or? He came back at ten thirty at night. Ten thirty at night. With um with another worker who didn't even know my name, 
he calls me Barry Hill rather than Elizabeth Barry Hill. Um, my son answered the door because I and the boys had already had our baths and went to bed at 8.30 at night. And my son answered the door and John McCarthy was sitting there, standing there with two police officers and this other CPS worker. And he stated, I'm here to pick up the boys. My son said, hang on, let me get my mom and shut the door. My house is not a very big house. So he walked through the kitchen into the dining room, knocked on my door, said, Mom, CPS worker's here. And the CPS workers and the two police officers were standing in my dining room right outside my bedroom in split seconds. No invite, no nothing. Do they have a court order to remove they had the nothing. child? They had so nothing. So they uh, used uh, preponderance or the burden of proof that the children were in imminent danger? Mr. McCarthy told the courts, in which I did not check the central registry 24 hours a day, because I know everybody that lives on my lake. Um, David Reeder, who is the boyfriend, had registered at my address four days beforehand and stated that he lived at my house. I did not know nothing about it. Um, he then asked, had asked me a couple days before the boys were removed, could he do so? And I said, I would need to speak with Ted about that because it is Ted's house. But it was more of, I didn't think that I wanted, you know, people driving by my address going, there's a sex offender that lives there. In which, when he was 13 years old, he had gotten trumped up sex offender charges. 13 years old, huh? 13 years old. He and came from a very neglectful and abusive family. Okay. Well, um, have you been to court over Jason? Yes. The day after they were removed, we went to uh, Cherry St or Cedar Street, the courthouse there, yeah. Leonard and Ball, and talked to a referee. Then um, a couple hours after that, we went down to DHS, to CPS, to talk, speak with the supervisor for some hearing, which ended up not going anywhere. They just listened to Mr. McCarthy. Then that afternoon, after that, we had to go back. We had to go up to the courthouse for another referee hearing. Mm -hmm. And did they put both Jason and Derek together as one case? Yes. Now, why would that be? Uh, because the daughter had custody of Derek and you had custody of Jason. When did they find out that you had actual guardianship of that? My child? attorney went to the judge and told the judge that I was the legal guardian of Jason because the CPS worker was trying to make it sound like I only had temporary emergency guardianship. And so then the judge turned around and um, he, was, he made another court date and said that they needed to figure out why I was on central registry before they went any further about the guardianship. And within, before we even got to the next hearing, the CPS worker got a court hearing and had my guardianship dissolved. So rather than him going to court and saying this is what it was for, he went and had it dissolved. Well, the CPS worker did that? Or yes, CPS worker did, did it. The judge did not order that? or judge did not order it. He says you have two weeks to bring me evidence as to why she was on central registry. And CPS just went over and had it dissolved with yep. their friends yep. that they work with every day. Yep. <laughs> well, that's... That don't seem right. No. <laughs> Since then, have you seen your grandchildren? I was able to have two. At first it was the one hour visits. Then it went to two hours, once a week. Then it went to two times a week for two hours, in which we had made it so that when my daughter visited Jason and Derek at the service, the, the Lutheran Family Services, 
um, she would do so so she could be watched as to her parenting. And then when we had our unsupervised visits outside of there, I would, I would come and do the two hours because that, Tana required me to be able to drive her anyways. Um, now you had your visit separate? No, no I've never had a separate doing, visit. You're doing them together. Yeah. And then the worker that had a, that all set up, um, something happened. And I believe it, it had to do with her feelings and the fact that she was trying to um, push this case as fast as she could to get the boys back home. And she ended up quitting Lutheran Family Services. And they gave us another uh, service worker. And this worker has no children. And she learned she, by the book of uh, that they teach. Yeah, in the, the book college. of yeah, this is how do you, yeah, and has also told my daughter that she needs to watch Dr. Phil every week. Did they give you parenting classes? Did they? Well, I guess they dissolved your guardianship. So why would they give you parenting classes? Right, my attorney turned around and went to the judge and got me totally taken off of everything. And he, they were also supposed to drop any of the charges and essential registry stuff um, against me down too. It was supposed to all be dissolved because they were just trying to reunite Jason with his mom. That was, that's their goal, is to have the child back with his mother who he's never been with his mother. Have they given her any parenting classes? Yes, and she, um, she did her parenting classes, graduated her parenting classes, um, by the second hearing, she had already been three steps ahead of every, anybody who's ever gone through court. That other than that, you know, she, she already had most of everything done. And then we got this new caseworker and everything just hung in limbo. Hung in limbo and... Yeah, they had nothing the, else that nothing she was supposed to do. To they do didn't get her into single counseling. They wanted her to go to domestic violence. Has her rights been terminated yet? No. So they're probably shooting, uh, have they, uh, they keep put threatening anything, her with threatening, it. They're threatening her. her with terminating her rights now? Yes. Uh, why, when she com evidently completed uh, courses and there was nothing else for her to because, take? Okay, the, the case manager, this Jessica, the new one with no kids, was yelled at, reprimanded by the judge because they weren't trying to get Tiana into single counseling you know, individual counseling. They wanted her to do domestic violence counseling. And the judge was like, why does she need domestic violence counseling? This is a 24-year-old mom who's had both her children removed from her. She needs individual counseling or you're, you got her right on the track to, to failure. And he said, by this afternoon, you need to have everything set up. And right after we left the courthouse, we took my daughter and got her set up in counseling. Okay, is she uh, set up right now, presently? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so and the only thing she's going to talk about is the impact that the, all this is having on her. You're still working on that aspect. Yep. Um, are you able to see the children right now? No. I was getting once a month, but it's gone longer than once a month. As, is your daughter seeing the children? Yes, she's seen them twice a week and they're all supervised visits. But they're not allowing the grandparent to see them? No, they oh, said that grandparents' law says that I am allowed one hour, one hour a month. One hour a month? Yes, when in reality, a grandparent who is very involved in their grandchildren's lives see their grandchildren every day. Well, yes, of course. Uh, that, that's, and that's one of the things they uh, told us, uh, myself. Uh, you know, grandparents are involved so much in their grandchildren's life, yet we have very limited laws covering our intake of our grandchildren. Yeah. Well, this, this worker that she's got that, like before every visit, she makes it a point to intimidate my daughter and threaten her with taking away her um, visitation and going for termination. Um, that, number one, it sets my daughter off. My daughter is a very strong-willed girl. And um, so when my daughter goes into her visits, she automatically, the, the boys know that something's wrong. 
and that, so they act out. But this lady has gone to my daughter and told my daughter that she relies on me too much. But the, the judge has no problem knowing that I, who live on Social Security, am, am paying my daughter's rent. I pay all her bills. I buy all her food. And I pay for her transportation to go see the boys. Well, Beth, we're finding out through our discovery that these agencies are the ones that seem to be the ones manipulating the court system. The agency, if they don't have the children, certainly don't get any federal funding. They get right. anywhere from $39 to $175 a day uh, per child, depending right. upon if the child is labeled or not. And are these children, are they on any drugs or? They, um, now Jason, when he was with me, saw the doctor regularly. In fact, before he was removed in August, he got uh, the rivovirus. Uh -huh. uh, it started out food poisoning from Are they on any mental drugs? Such Not right now, but they're trying ADHD. to push it. They're they have Jason. Push. They said Jason has a speech problem, which I could so, understand Jason so clearly. Yeah. They have him going to special classes. They also said that if my if the children go back to my daughter, they would like my daughter to continue sending her kids to Cedar Springs to these special classes. So uh, Lutheran Services is really pushing labeling these children. Right. Um, in fact, um, in Kent County, um, Kent County CPS contracts out their work 100% to the agencies. Right. And it certainly shows in uh, the children that are not being returned to their parents. It sounds to me like you have a good judge, but does he know what's going on? No, and because I yeah. was taken and exonerated from the case, I've been subpoenaed into court and listened to the CPS worker talk about me as if I was the worst mother in the world. Um, and I could say nothing about it, and they never called me up to testify. And um, who's the judge on this case? Judge Denenfeld. Okay. He uh, evidently must be new or something. But, uh, um, I don't know. Fortunately, you have a different judge than some of the judges that we uh, know in the system, so that might help you a little bit. And I want to keep up to date on what's happening. Is there anything else you want to tell the audience before we leave? Um, my daughter gave me the go-ahead to do this. I was putting everything off because I was worried about repercussions. But because they were already reprimanded by the judge, the repercussions have started. And my daughter cried, and she said, Mama, I need you to get Jason back into your house. That's where he's safest. And she says, I need Derek back in my life. I can't be a parent only four hours a week. I have to be a parent 24 hours a day. Well, thank you, Beth, for coming on the show. And I mean, this is what it's about, silent voices. This is the voice that the public is being, becoming aware of what's going on here. Right. And I want to thank you guys at home for watching. Silent Voices. Uh, if you have any comments, you can email us here at the station at miparentalrights at gmail.com. That's miparentalrights at gmail.com. We also have a social network that we would love you to join. We have events going on. We have a protest, protest coming up in August. Uh, that's at miparentalrights.ning.com. miparentalrights.ning.com. Thank you for watching, and remember, your voice can make the difference.